Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's your boy right here, Tony, with stories written by a current prisoner. Just check, just kicking it right here with my homeboy, Muhammad, and the Muhammad Onward Project. You know, go ahead and check it out. Hit that subscribe button, and most definitely hit that like button. You, me and my boy right here are fitting the collab once again. An inmate at Women's Correctional Center. To accept this call, press or say five. This call will be recorded and subject to monitoring at any time. Thank you for using. You may begin speaking now. Hey, how are Hello? you? How are you? Good, how are you? I'm great. Hey, everybody. Um, it's me, Sheree. Uh, I'm 30 years old. I'm locked up here in Pocatello. And um, just looking for somebody to talk to, write to maybe, just some people to help me pass time. Add me on JPA. My number is 110-808. And like I said, just looking to laugh, have a good time, um, get to know people. So. Okay, so um, I guess I'm looking for legal assistance because the nature of my crime, um, I've been locked up for seven, almost eight years now. And a lot of people that I've come across, like, um, I guess a lot of people on the streets have looked at my case or whatever and told me that they are surprised I had taken a plea agreement. And the reason I had taken one was because uh, during my pre-trial sentence and all of that and whatnot, my public defender had told me that if I didn't take a plea agreement, that I was going to get life. So when he had originally told me about the plea agreement, he told me that I would probably get seven years, eight years, no more than 10 though. But at sentencing, when they read my sentence, they had given me 15 plus 15. So at the time I was only 23 and a lot of people realized when you're 23 just because you're of your age doesn't make you an adult. Um, I didn't understand really what I was being told by my public defender and it was his first murder manslaughter case. So I don't think he really knew what he was doing. He was just trying to get it over and done with. But um, I was told that I could have gotten self-defense just because of the nature of my crime. Um, I don't know if do you want me to give a couple details? Yes, um, yes. Can you elaborate and, you know, uh, okay, some more? So, Originally, originally charged with second degree murder, and then afterwards it was put down to voluntary manslaughter. And the difference between the two is second degree murder is with malice, voluntary manslaughter is without malice. So what had happened was I had a friend, and she came over to my house looking for help, and her husband had just beat her up. She had two black eyes, bloody nose, busted lip, and she came to my house looking for help. So I let her in. I gave her to use my phone. She called for a ride. During that time that she was at my house, her husband came over. I think it was her, her husband or her boyfriend. I can't remember if they were actually married. But he came over looking for her. I let him in. He looked around a little bit. He was drunk. And within five minutes of being there, he told me that he had, had beat her up really bad. So he left, came back a second time while she was still there. But there was a bunch of other people at the house, too. By the third time he came back, I was annoyed. I had my friend's kids in the living room that had school the next morning. Um, everybody was sleeping, and he was just yelling out in the front lawn. So my friend's husband was out there, too. He was drinking with one of his friends, and he heard the whole situation. Well, the guy, my victim, started yelling, threatening me. So I, he had a knife in his hand, so I went and grabbed one, too. He ran into my house, tried to attack me, tried to kill me, and I fought back. So while we were arguing in the front yard, because of that, my judge said that because I antagonized him and because I ridiculed him, that basically that was deserving of him attacking me. So all they did was focus on what I had done wrong. Nobody really paid attention to the fact that he tried to kill me, only that he ended up dying, which wasn't my intention. I wasn't trying to kill him. I really was just fight or flight. And a lot of people, if they know the way that we grow up, um, gang lifestyle, on a street lifestyle, they know that in that situation, either you fight or something's gonna happen to you. So I fought back which is another thing they told me in court was that I conveyed or showed a tough girl persona. And I believe they brought up my tattoos, which are not gang affiliated, um, and just kind of talked down on my character and everything because of the way I looked. So, but yeah, I'm looking for any kind of legal assistance. I was trying to do a sentence commutation. Uh, I did a post conviction. They denied it. Um, I don't really know what else there is that I can do, but I'm, anybody that can help me, especially with the sentence commutation, the case managers here told me that I should look into getting an attorney for, or somebody that can help me, legal aid that can help me with the post, or sentence commutation, just because of the nature of my crime, because it's violent. 
So I guess that's really that <laughs> on a legal sentence part. Okay, I, I know in um, your intro you are addressed um, where they can locate you at and where you're incarcerated at and things of that nature. Can you briefly address again, um, be more specific, where can they contact you at? Uh, whether it be pen pals or, or um, you know, legal people and um, prison reform people or whatnot? Yeah, I'm in Public Child Women's Correctional Center in Public Child, Idaho. My IDOC number is 110808. And my name is Sheree Moreno. Yeah. Okay, we're going to begin with some questions now. So the first question I have for you is what's your nationality? Native American and Hispanic. Where are you I'm from out here in the streets? Um, well, I was from Cali. I don't talk about that really much anymore, but um, basically I'm just from Idaho now. Yeah. Blackfoot is where I caught my charge. This is where I mostly grew up around. And this is, I guess, this is where my mom's entire family is. So this is pretty much home. But before, I guess if we're going in the gang direction, I, I was north side for a while. And everybody knows stuff happens. And we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> were you ever part of any gangs, groups, organizations or associate or hang out with any of these individuals? In here? Um, out in the streets and in there, whichever one. Yeah, just on the streets, they were in the north side. And uh, if you don't mind me asking, how do you get involved with that organization? Um, it's just, I guess, being alone. It's what appealed to me. A lot of times, um, I don't know, I just live alone, and they, they just love me. It's harder for a female to get into that, into that gang, that group, and so I worked my ass off. I kind of grew up tomboy and whatnot, and it just, it's just what was home for me. I, I, I can't say I had a bad childhood. That's not necessarily true, but around the age of nine, I started getting bad, and it's just, it was home. Instead of all the fighting in the household, it was just love. Like, obviously, there was arguments and whatnot, but it was just a bunch of us who understood each other and who cared, who had each other's backs, who wrote for each other. And that's, that's what it felt to me, was a home. People who cared, people who looked at me and was like, they gave a shit what happened to me. When you first got sentenced, how you feel about it? And when you first went to prison and hit the main line, what was your mentality? Uh, when I first got sentenced, I didn't really... My mentality at that time was that I was just, it was just whatever, time's time. And I guess for me in the grand scheme of things, it was just like, it's, I guess it was just whatever, but that was right at sentencing. And it wasn't until I turned around, I see my mom and like, honestly, I just started crying because at the end of the day, I'm still her baby. So, but when I got up here, the way I started my time, I fought a lot uh, because I didn't care. I didn't really take things seriously. And I guess you could say that the fact that I was doing 15 plus 15 hadn't really kicked in yet, maybe. So, I don't know, I was reckless. Destructive, reckless, and I didn't care. I was just angry. Still angry. Still young and still angry. And so, for the first few years, I did a lot of time on, on lockdown in my own room. It was in county. I did a year and a half in county before I actually came up here. I came up here for two weeks. They fast-tracked me, pushed me back out. And I did a year and a half in county where I just fought, argued, was disrespectful reckless, whatever, and it wasn't until I got back up here and I had to talk with one of the lieutenants and he just, he made it clear that if I didn't, if I, if I didn't start caring that I was going to end up topping my time and at 23, 30 years later, it's going to be 53. So I wasn't trying to, I don't know, it made, it made a big difference. I learned, I learned a lot of things in those first few years when I got up here and this prison is not like the men's prisons. It's it's like a cupcake camp compared to what they do, but it's also a bunch of petty women who have had all responsibility taken away and have nothing more to do but gossip. So it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. So but my mentality was I didn't care. So what causes, like, drama and, and fights there, if you don't mind me asking, if you can elaborate on that a little bit, if you can't, then that will be fine as well. Well, I'm glad you did. 
I'm glad you did. <laughs> uh, in here, it's girlfriend drama. Girlfriend drama. They don't. There's. Uh, it's insane because in a lot of a lot of men's prisons and a lot of the real women's prisons, snitching doesn't happen. But here, it's one minute they're one minute they hate this person for snitching and they're, and they're fighting them, and then it's, the next minute they're they're best friends with them. They're like you. You would have thought they were friends for years. Um, girlfriend drama. There's a lot of. I guess you can say lesbians, bisexuals, transgenders, actually, too, and um, get to the day, I guess you could say, but most of the drama that's in here surrounds girlfriends, and I guess who slept with who, who slept with whose girlfriend, who's dating who now, and it, it's just, it's like being in middle school all over again, which is really surprising, because like I said, when I started my time, I really didn't imagine it was going to be like this, but it's, it's literally like a big middle school, high school gossip jump drama zone. Um, there's a few fights that are actually like real fights for I guess you could say fishing, but aside from that it's just girlfriend stuff. It's it's comical and it's entertaining to watch mostly. <laughs> so And um what is the penalty for getting into fights and things of that nature? Um it depends on the circumstances. Uh, uh like there's a few girls that I've known. One of them is really close to me. She's gotten in probably, we'll say, 15 minimum of fights since she's been here, and she's never been accessed, which is administrative segregation. They put you in your own room. You're cuffed everywhere you go. You're cuffed to the table, cuffed to the kiosk, no matter where you go, unless you're in the small cages out at REC. Um, ADSEG is, is, I guess, it's the worst here, I guess you could say. Um, you can get it anywhere from 30 to 30 days to six months. Um, one of the transgender girls who was on the testosterone shots, she tried to kill her last girlfriend, strangled her. And uh, she didn't, obviously, but the girl slash boy was absent for six months. Uh, yeah, it just depends on the degree of the fight, the nature of the fight. Um, sometimes girls just get six day cell restriction, seven day cell restriction or detention, which is you don't get, you get all state issue stuff not too bad. Or you can get 45, 60, 90 days. It just depends. And what would you have to say to the youngsters out here that's um, involved in gang or criminal activity or thinking about joining gangs and getting involved in criminal activity? I would have to say the gang life that I grew up in, we weren't stupid. A lot of us weren't stupid. We could have done better things with our lives. At least that's what I was told. Um, and I'm, I'm not by any means ignorant. I'm a very intelligent, edu educated woman. I just decided to do stupid things with my intelligence. Everybody wants to be a hustler, but take that mentality and turn it into a business. Why do you, why do you have to make money the illegal way? Make it the positive way. A lot of people, natural born hustlers, they know how to make that money. They know how to get that paper. So why not start a business plan? Why not have your own business? There's a million different ways and a million different areas that you can go to instead of throwing your life away with gangs or with this or with that, depending on whatever reason you get into it. But there's a lot of different homes too and a lot of different places you don't have to find into gang life. But just make something yourself. Everybody, we're given so many gifts in life by, I don't know if this is, okay, this might sound religious, but by our creator, by God. We're given so many different gifts in life. Why waste it on mediocre things that are, I mean, none of those things, none of those things on the streets they don't, there's no, there's no insurance in them. There's no insurance policy. So at some point you're going to get old and you're not going to have anything. So why not set something aside? Do something with yourself. Be smarter. Can you Be more have, intelligent. Oh, okay. Keep on going. If, if you're not finished. No, that's fine. Uh, that was it. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. Can you elaborate on a little bit more on uh, your upbringing? Um, you know, growing up in uh, Idaho or, or, you know, where the city you're located in, you know, and, um, you know, what yeah. led you to, you know, you know, a certain lifestyle and, and things of that nature. Okay, so I grew up back and forth between Idaho and California, but most of it was spent here in Idaho. Um, and that was, that wasn't part of the gang life. But my dad, he worked and he, he's an alcoholic. He's a functional one now, so I don't know if anybody knows what that means, but it means he's, he can actually hold a job, he can do day-to-day -day life things, but he just, he still, every day he still drinks. Um, my mom, she was a perfect housewife, 
until they got divorced, and she's just worked. She's a hard worker. She's one of the, I know a lot of people say this about their moms, but she's the most amazing, beautiful woman I know in my life. And if I can eat, if I can be even half of where she is, then I will be proud of myself. But my childhood, um, a lot of bad things happened to me in regards to family members. Um, wasn't the greatest, I guess you could say, taken advantage of by some cousins. And um, I had a big, a big family on my mom's side. Uh, I think I have like 20 something first cousins, probably more than that. Uh, I have 11 aunties and uncles. And we were a close family. Um, barbecues, birthdays, parties, camping, all of that good stuff. Uh, so it wasn't a bad childhood. And I think a lot of people look at me and they misunderstand just because of where I'm at, thinking that, oh, I had to have had a bad childhood. No, it was actually really good up until the age of nine, which I guess I'll, I'll just keep it short and say I was taken advantage of by somebody really close to my family. And so after that, I kind of just stopped caring and even stopped caring even more after my parents divorced. So that's which is what led me to go find something else elsewhere. Okay, I don't have any more questions for you, but do you have anything else to add before we um, close this interview? Uh, I don't know. I guess, like I said, I'm looking for the legal help, pen pals, just whatever, anything to help me pass time. I have 15 plus 15. I'm um, eight years into my sentence, and it gets lonely. Like, I have family, but just... People with like minds, people who are trying to be positive, people who are trying to do something with their lives, people that can't, like I'm not trying to hustle anybody, I'm just looking for people to talk to, people to be there, somebody that can keep my mind focused on doing good when I get out, or whatever. But, I mean, obviously it's a long way away, but good people stay, you know, people who aren't worth it usually leave. So, anything I really appreciate. Go ahead and give a shout out to your families and friends and what have you um, right now. Oh, you want me to give a shout out? Yeah, to your family and friends or whatnot. You don't have to, but if you if you, if you got any, um, you want to, you can. Uh, I mean, no, not really. <laughs> oh, okay, then then. Uh, I give a shout out to my mom because she's just such an amazing woman, and she's like, I guess she could say every. I, a piece of, she's my hero. She's my hero because she's a strong-minded woman. So, mom, I love you. And um, a few friends that I have that have kept in touch with me, you guys are amazing. You guys are so solid, and a lot of times I feel like I don't deserve you guys. So thank you for staying in my life. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that's Cherie from Idaho, Pocatello, um, Women's Prison. Um, we appreciate you taking the time um, to give this uh, exclusive interview. Um, we appreciate it. And you enjoy the rest of your day.